So we're gonna go ahead and get started. So hello and welcome everybody. My name is Nicole Methvin and I am a career advisor here at the University of Arizona Global Campus. I will be the host of this session, Culture of Care, Exploring Perceptions of Support from the University of Arizona Global Campus doctoral students. By joining us today, you acknowledge that this session is being re recorded and will be shared with TLC related materials. Microphones will be muted for this presentation, but we highly encourage you to post questions and be engaging in comments within the chat. Also, we have enabled live transcription. So if you would like to use it, click the live transcription button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now I am pleased to introduce you to Dr. Kelly Olson Stewart, Associate Professor in the Department of Liberal Arts and Education here at the University of Arizona Global Campus, as well as the Program Chair in the PhD Education Program. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks everybody for being here. It's lovely to see familiar faces. Currently, one of the dogs is snoring exceptionally loud, so hopefully that doesn't disturb this session today, but you never know when we're working from home. Thank you for being here to hear about this uh, UFP grant-funded study, so that's University Fellows Program. And I'm gonna use the pronoun we a lot because this study certainly was conducted um, around all of the doc programs. So there are four, for those of you who don't know, there's a psych program, PhD ed program, health and human services, and uh, ODL. Um, I just lost the word for a second. And those four programs, all of the students were studied, um, but the doctoral team is robust and full of very, very, uh, outstanding faculty, students, and um, so the we is comprehensive because there's a team behind the information that we're going to talk about today. Just an example, this is from 2022 and our doctoral graduates, um, their smiling faces as this is our post ceremony. And so I want to recognize the student voices that participated in the study and were willing to give their input and the faculty who have been encouraging and then are going to, ideally, we're going to use this data to move us forward. So thanks. So we are open access doctoral programs. So a little different for um, some of you potentially. I think it's different as well for some of our associate faculty. Um, Right now, there are there's no gateway, right, to come in other than your master's degree is your first step. And so one of the university goals has been around retention and completion of programs. This is something certainly we're monitoring. We're always looking to see, you know, where our students are at, how are they doing in the programs. And the goal of this study was really to capture student voices. Certainly, anecdotally, we talk to students all the time. Associate faculty talk to them. Uh, our staff, you know, library, writing center, amazing colleagues there that are hearing the student perspective. But we recognize that we did not have a comprehensive way to capture student voice, their experiences, their perceptions, and their challenges. And in the last two years, now three with uh, since 2020, we've implemented culture of care. And we did not know um, in an organized way how those tenets of culture of care were being received specifically by our doc students. Additionally, we're super aware of the barriers, the challenges that doctoral students often face. We all know from our own journeys working on degrees that it's a challenging place as an adult learner online with kiddos, with families, with jobs, multiple jobs, with snoring dogs, all of the things that there are, there are um, systematic problems that get in our way. There's life problems that get in our way. So we had a sense of some of those barriers, but then it's really looking at the specific barriers that students would identify and figuring out, okay, what what's in our control and what's not in our control. And so when we look at those barriers that are in our control, what can we do to better support students so that they're likely to retain in the program, that they're likely to persist through a doctoral journey? And that's really what this uh, study was about. So as you're thinking about this time together, some questions to consider would be, how do you use a similar approach? 
How are you capturing the insights of your, perhaps your colleagues, your program, stakeholders? How does the data that you get back provide a roadmap for future planning? I think we do a lot of data collection, but how do we then use that data to plan ahead? What does our strategic planning look like? How can we better leverage the voice of our students or stakeholders in that strategic planning? How are we capturing what the student's experience is truly like? What are those barriers that are getting in the way that we can remove for them? And then this idea around how do we ensure in a doctoral program that culture of care is framed with high expectations and rigor. It is a doctoral program. So what do the tenets of culture of care look like as it is framed in the doc world? And then this idea of consistency of experience. So our students you know, go through program courses and research courses, and then they start writing their dissertation. So how do we ensure that there's consistency across all of those courses that they take? So the experience, the expectations, um, and that students feel confident every time they walk into a class. As a former middle school teacher, I remember very clearly sitting in a parent meeting where a parent said to me, they know they have a syllabus for your class. They have uh, an agenda on the board. Uh, you know, It looks a certain way every single day. You follow a routine. And then they get up and they leave and they go to science class. That teacher doesn't use an agenda. They don't have a robust syllabus. Uh, the experience has labs in it. It's very different. So it was jarring for students. It's their first time that they're switching classes. Sort of similar in the doc world. As they switch classes, they're looking for some um, things that they can hang their hat on, things that are, are common, common expectations, a common organization. So again, something that we can think about. Certainly in looking at the literature, uh, just a brief literature overview around doctoral students. Self-belief, self-efficacy is essential for students. We know that. We know that the demands of working adults with families is intense. The COVID experience, exceptionally intense. Mental health, well-being uh, has definitely been um, at the forefront of our thinking and experiences. We know the importance of quality staff faculty engagement is essential. Our staff are superb and they have a lot of interaction with students. And so they absolutely should not be left out of the equation and the literature says so. Um, and this idea around connection, that in the online space, the cohort type of vibe, the, the collaborative experience is absolutely essential for students to feel like they're not in it alone because isolation and imposter syndrome is very, very real. So here's our, where our two research questions. The perceptions, what are the perceptions of support of doctoral students at UAGC? And what are those perceived barriers? This was a simple emailed survey in Qualtrics, qualitative analysis, multiple choice questions, and of course, open-ended responses. And our students were very excited about the open-ended responses. And we ended up with, I think, over 55 pages of comments, like they had a lot that they wanted to say. So when we pooled our students for this specific study, we knew that our persistence rates were around 42 to 50% of our, of, across the four programs uh, actually start and complete their dissertation or ADP, Applied Doctoral Project. So they finish their degree and they're called doctor. And so we were just looking at the students from 2020 to 2022. We really wanted to capture the picture of what the COVID experience and the culture of care was on DOC students. Unfortunately, we only got 11% response rate, which I'm such a nerd about uh, response rates that I just, I always want there to be 80%. I know that is not very likely, but 11%. Uh, so it's a very small picture. And I want to recognize as well that this is just a snapshot, right? This is a snapshot in time. And the reality is, is that this that, or this this survey instrument we use could be given once a year. Um, you know, it could be good in every six months with some tweaks. And so to continually capture our incoming students and our outgoing students on their experience, 
I think it will look different 2023 to 2024 with some of the changes that we have put into place already. Um, so if you take a look there, of the surveyed group, there were 124 currently enrolled students, 13 who had graduated, and 30 who had left the program. Those, of course, are hard to capture because oftentimes their email addresses have also changed. But we felt like talking to those who left was very important to find out why, like what happened, um, and what are some of the factors, again, that we can control about their leaving. So those are the numbers by program. And just as a note, the psych program is the largest of the four programs and uh, the HS uh, Health and Human Services is the smallest program and then ODL and then ED. So the big ideas, like what did students actually tell us at Quick Blush? The most helpful for them. So again, a shout out to staff, the academic advisors. They are essential and that communication the encouragement and support that the advisors bring to our students cannot be uh, overstated. Instructors are the most helpful. Our students recognize the importance of the library in the doc journey, which makes a lot of sense. Tutorials, resources, and the staff of the library. They also noticed curriculum, text that was current, that was engaging, that was practical, readings, videos. They love having videos and videos from staff as well as embedded videos in the in the curriculum. Classmates, for many students, and this is an ongoing encouragement, like find somebody in the class, right? Find a friend, make a text buddy chain, you know, encourage each other. Classmates were uh, deemed by students as the most helpful. And the in-residence experience. So for those of you not at UAGC, um, savvy around our what we do the in residence used to be in person so po pre 2020 um post has been all on zoom it's a two-day experience there's three in residences that students go through over the course of their program they are on zoom with a, a faculty member and get support from the library and the writing center faculty or uh, staff and and their classmates and they make connections and they talk about their topic and we talk about best practices and self-care and all of the all of the things. Um, so the in-residents were viewed as being helpful. The, the note was it was more helpful when it was in person. The experience of being together in the same room is different than Zoom, we all know that. But recognizing that you do what you have to do and moving to Zoom is more convenient, more cost-effective, um, and certainly was captured by students as being helpful so that they could be at home. Um, the least helpful, and to be super fair, student clubs and champs mentoring are not something that were plentifully used in the doc world. However, I'm gonna talk about how we are going to start implementing some of those things, but we don't have robust doctoral clubs yet. And champs mentoring, we put a pause on for DOC, but we're revitalizing. So some of the factors that supported um, students and enhanced their progress, specific tips and strategies, stories shared by their instructors, again, the use of video, classmates, instructor feedback that was clear, robust, and specific was mentioned over and over again about how important and essential that was. And in the DOC world, we talk a lot about receiving feedback as a gift and recognizing it's part of the iterative process and students were recognizing that. Additionally, students specifically mentioned the helpfulness of having clear course directions, examples of final products, final assignments, what they look and sound like. They have a We have a great dissertation handbook, seeing examples of LOIs, seeing examples of what does synthesis mean, what does synthesized writing look and sound like, all important. Additionally, engaged instructors, evidence that instructors cared for them, flexibility with deadlines, supportive comments. They valued relationships with instructors. This came up over and over and over in all kinds of ways in the data, that the relationships that they can forge over six or nine week courses with instructors and or chair and committee members is essential. So what are things that got in their way? Some of the barriers, lack of time, their family life, finances, um, their job was just ended up compelling too much of their time, pulling them in. The writing, 
So challenges with their own writing skills kept coming up in the data. Uh, not only insecurity around that, but actual, they weren't able to continue on in the program because they didn't have the writing skills, the critical thinking skills um, to be able to move them forward. And then that imposter syndrome again, feelings of insecurity. Other piece that, that comes up oftentimes with online. And so I think this is something that we need to keep thinking about. And everybody has had some really innovative ideas over the last uh two or three days here, is this idea of the isolation of online, that that authentic connection with classmates and instructors, for those who, for those students that this is really important, how do we bridge that for them? How do we create opportunities to connect for those who want that um, connection? Writing expectations. So, so uh, the structure of the assignments themselves, those examples, the writing expectations was getting in the way. And at this very moment in time, there is no remedial writing that we can send students to, but this is something that we may wanna consider. Students also mentioned that they wish that they had had the opportunity to identify their topic for their dissertation or ADP earlier and had more time to write. So right now, the way that the program is set up is everything is program centric, it's in the, the content courses are first. There's research courses embedded in content courses. So program courses, and then they write an LOI or a PJT. And so this is their proposal uh, outline, basically seven to 10 paragraphs. And then they start with dissertation writing. And so many, many, many students in the data said, hey, could we do that earlier? Could I get more feedback sooner? Could I write an LOI after my first in-residence um, and have more time because the goal is to complete a dissertation in five nine-week terms or complete an ADP. So that's 45 weeks, everything to do with the whole thing. So it's a very robust timeline. And so students said, could we do it? Could we start earlier? And could I wrestle through that literature earlier? Um, students also reference the challenge of the program courses and the research courses. There's different instructor expectations, different instructor pools. Again, it's kind of like that going from my language arts class to the science class. It's, in some ways, it's jarring for students. The tone is different. The organization is different. So that was getting in their way. And the inconsistency of the instructors. How, do we, how, do, how can we ensure that students have the same sort of feeling in the courses? So then it's like, okay, we have all of this good stuff, all 50 pages of, of stories and information and data. And it's like, what do we have control over? And what are things that we, we can't control that are outside of our circle? And so taking a look at the data with that lens. So some things we can do. All right, so students struggle with time management. I mean, we all struggle with time management. So what are some supportive strategies that we could put into place earlier even in the program around time management? How can we help model time management, provide suggestions um, and set up structures to organize time better? And also students oftentimes don't recognize the amount of time that a successful doctoral student has to put in. It's about 15 to 20 hours a week. It's another job. And so how can we better help students earlier. Another place to explore, how do we make those connections? How do we reduce the isolation feel? How can we create a more of a cohort vibe for students? And are there ways that we can leverage CHAMPS mentoring or leverage student clubs to reduce that isolation or simply meetups or virtual meetups so that students can come and talk with each other? How could we adjust curriculum to start their topic identification, their writing earlier, so that students have a longer time and space? I always talk about the marination of their ideas. Some students need longer and need to be spending more time in the literature. So how could we adjust the program so that, that it could be earlier? Um, I think the curriculum questions were fascinating, and it's one thing just as a former K-8 K curriculum director that I think we oftentimes skip asking students around. So I encourage you to ask your students around you about curriculum. Um, another, another topic, how do we provide more or different academic writing support? 
you know, the UAG Studio Writing Center and the colleagues who work there are absolutely amazing. And I cannot say how many times a day I literally use those resources. And there's so much good stuff there that students oftentimes miss, like all that's there. So are there ways that we could identify additional resources? Could we utilize small webinars um, that are timely as students are at different places in the writing process? The in-residence and the writing center are certainly paired together, but maybe are there other ways that we might consider? Hi, Nicole, I see you. There are there other ways that we might consider with writing support. Um, another, another area to look at is this idea of alignment and course design across programs and research. Certainly our students are in their programs and then they go over to a research course and they come back to the program. How do we make sure that that's a more seamless experience for them? And then what are some strategies to generate the consistency of our instructors to ensure that it's not a jarring switch from course to course for our students? So some of the things specifically that we are looking at, and I, I'm speaking now around just PhD ed, um, that Ellen and I, my other half, have been brainstorming, is this idea around how do we create, we have a PhD ed student club, it hasn't been super active yet, but starting in January, we have a PhD ed speaker and support series that are launching, where we have our doctoral graduates, PhD ed specific graduates that are going to come and present to whoever shows up at the time that works for the speaker, and they are going to share strategies. They are going to share their experience, whatever that the nuggets of goodness that they learned along their journey that they can bring back and share. That I think will help bridge some connections because the other part of the time is just open time. What's working? What challenges are you having? Uh, where do you need support? So that we can hear regularly from students and then those will be recorded for students who can't be there at that very moment. Um, we're looking at the in-residence structure. How can we better utilize that time to make sure that we're being supportive to what students need at the specific time along their journey? How can we create some collaboration, collaborative events? You know, now here in Arizona, I now know there's a handful of our students that are specifically, I could meet at the coffee shop down the street. Is that potentially an option for some connection across the, across the United States? I don't think we can go. We have a lot of students from American Samoa. So if somebody needs me to go to American Samoa to meet those students, I, I will say yes. And then we're also looking at revitalizing the CHAMPS doctoral mentoring. So getting some mentors in place. I see some names that are on that are here that would make stellar mentors, just the cheerleader and encourager for, for our students so they feel less alone. And then how can we help students with that writing piece? So we're looking at where we could put additional supports in. We're trying to create really relevant and practical content in our courses, including grant writing, looking at LOIs earlier, um, very practical applications of writing. And we're bringing in a specific writing course in PhD ed around scholarly writing. And then this idea of culture of care and high expectations with flexibility, care, and communication. So overall, students see you, staff, they, they recognize that the bonds that they are form forming with you are absolutely transformative in their experience. They see that you provide a level of care, flexibility, grace, empathy, generosity. Those tenets of culture of care are very, very real in the doctoral program. And ultimately it comes down to relationships relationships with each other, relationships uh, with staff and faculty. These are some of the amazing students and faculty and staff in the doctoral world. Uh, grateful for all of you and grateful for you choosing this session today. And I'm super curious on some insights. I see there's lots of things happening in the chat. So those were your consider questions. Um, glad if you wanna chat further, um, chat offline. Uh, appreciate you very much. And uh, Nicole, I'm not sure if there's anything specific there in the chat because I can't keep up, but 
Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this, Dr. Stewart. This was so, I resonated with so much that you were saying, being a full-time staff member here myself, as well as a master's level student here at UAGC, this was just absolutely amazing. And there were a couple of questions that came in from the Whova platform that Cole dropped in. So one of the questions is, how do you ensure that your culture of care is more than just a tagline? It seems like it has to be an action. Absolutely. I think that's something that we have ongoing conversations with our really amazing PhD at associate uh, pool. And then the other programs are doing the same thing. It's what does it actually look like as it lives out? So flexibility with deadlines is one of the tenets. So what does that mean? Does that mean any old time you can drop your assignment in? Not necessarily, right? There are, there are timelines, there's expectations. Um, what, what does allowing somebody grace, like things happen in people's lives. You know, you don't have to, you know, we don't need all, I don't need your doctor's note. Like, I believe you, you told me you were sick. You had a sick kid last night. We've all been there. And so yes, just get the assignment in the next day. Yes. If you need to have till Wednesday to complete that, that's good to go. But ultimately still having high expectations, there are deadlines and timelines for things as well. So it's the conversations I think that we're having with associate faculty that are really important. And again, that consistency of those expectations across. And we have to go back and ask our students, what are they experiencing? Because they do leave us. I, I consider myself sort of the homeroom teacher, but they leave me to go out to their other classes. But I do need to capture their voice because I need to hear their experience. So this survey idea um, as an ongoing piece of collecting additional insights from students is really important. And I always tell my students that they're like secret shoppers out in the world, right? That they're in the program. So if something isn't going well, that they come back to their homeroom teachers, Ellen and I, and they give us their insights and experiences. And so that we can then go forth and make some tweaks where they may not be experiencing the same level of culture of care that we are hopeful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Stewart. I really appreciate that, especially, like I said, being a student, like just knowing that the faculty and staff are there to be a support system. It's so, so important, especially for our non-traditional students here at the University of Arizona Global Campus. Um, the other question that Cole had dropped into the chat from the Whova platform, I think we have time for one more. Um, it says that the doctoral, the doctoral journey can be isolating, especially during the dissertation stage. So how can faculty and staff support doctoral students through the entire process? Yeah, so that relationship with chair and committee is so important. Um, but I do think that there's a place for allowing students who are at the same point in time in their dissertation writing to connect. And so this is what we're looking for innovative ways to do that because what is powerful is talking about where the struggles are. I'm having problems getting better answers on my survey or I'm having problems recruiting participants or I'm struggling with how do you organize your notes for the literature review in chapter two. And so we have relied a lot on Dr. Heather Frederick's podcast. Lots of folks in this room have been a special guest on that. And I do think there's a place to start getting students together to just be in the same space, to, to brainstorm, to talk, and to have an expert in the room who's been through it, whether that is a grad or uh, an instructor, to guide that conversation so that we're giving students correct information, taking them back to the dissertation handbook, um, but making some additional connections. Wonderful. Thank you so much again for that. It looks like here that we are close to time. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this session. So thank you so much again, Dr. Kelly Olson Stewart, and thank you to the audience for all of your participation and engagement in today's session. I am going to go ahead in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and drop the TLC conference evaluation survey. So can you just please use the survey linked within the chat to just nominate, you know, a TLC presentation for the conference awards and just make sure that you share your feedback for your conference experience. It is very important and we value your feedback. Um, we do also encourage you to attend the next keynote presentation that is titled Female Students in Open Access Higher Education, How Could We Support, which takes place at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Thank you again so much for attending our session here today and please enjoy the rest of your time with TLC. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Cole.